All right, so hello, happy Thursday. We almost made it through the week, yay. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you today about unicorns, but also about people. And it's easy to be a unicorn, but it's difficult to be a person. And the kind of background for this talk is last year when I was looking for an engineering position, I would go through job descriptions and I would kind of read them to get a feel for the company. And a lot of them would say, we're looking for a unicorn, or a ninja, or a rock star, or a snowflake, or a wizard. And I was like, I'm none of these things. I'm a person. Why are they looking for something that's this weird, mythical, magical creature that has nothing to do with my ability to write code? And so now that I've been in the field for a little while, I kind of understand where that comes from. And since I've been in the field, there's been this differentiation between soft and hard skills. But I don't necessarily think we're doing it in a productive way. And so I kind of want to go over a little bit today about what soft and hard skills actually are, the hidden meanings of the terms, and why it's a little dangerous to use both of these terms to describe our abilities. After that, we're going to upgrade our terminology, and we're going to have some potential alternatives, because let's be real, we're developers. We can do better. If the tools aren't right, make new ones. And then I've got a couple tips and suggestions for you if you'd like to incorporate some of this in your workplace or in your open source communities as a teacher, a mentor, or a manager. So let's get started. We're going to start with soft and hard skills. And when we think about defining soft skills, it's actually not too terribly difficult. It's a pretty solidified concept, ironically. Uh, you think about things like team building and communication, friendliness, conflict resolution, influence and persuasion. And these are things that you want in a coworker. Maybe, maybe not like persuasion all the time, but definitely you want someone who's friendly and communicates effectively and communicates well. And for the most part, these all fall under the broader umbrella of project, team, and task management. And while some of them can be attributed to being a team leader or a manager of a team, they're also related to how well you can perform your job on a day-to-day. -day. Do you know your role on the project that you're working on? Do you understand your position and your duties? And can you manage your tasks effectively? Those are all soft skills that are very relevant to what we do in open source and what we do day-to-day. -day. And it's really, they're near requirements. Employers will actively seek this out. They may not necessarily advertise for it, but when you interview, they'll start talking to you about how you like to work as a group. What's your workflow? How do you feel about project managers? How do you feel about product managers? How do you like to work with QA? They kind of beat around the bush and they never ask you, are you good at communicating with other people? Which, just come on, let's ask the question. But so now they're near requirements, and it's a little silly that we call them soft skills. Like, it's, why are we describing something that's a near requirement as soft? Because when I think of soft things, I think of cheese and fluffy pillows and cute puppies. I don't think of my ability to communicate with a coworker or my ability to influence my manager to give me a raise when it's salary bump time. I think about these kinds of things. It's easy to mold, cut, compress, or fold. And these are just the first two dictionary definitions for soft. So these are the pretty standard colloquial meanings or to have a pleasing quality involving a subtle effect or contrast instead of something that's sharp. I don't want to think of my communication skills as easy to mold. I want to be a strong communicator. And I, well, I guess it's nice that my communication skills may have a pleasing quality. I want them to be well-defined. I don't want them to have a subtle effect. I want to be a good, effective communicator. And so it's becoming clear to me that this word doesn't accurately describe my abilities as a soft skills person, I guess. And it gets even more confusing when you think about synonyms for soft, and you start to find out that there's all these weird things that are associated with the word. Like when I say I think of cheese and pillows, mushy, that's a pillow. Maybe a cheese if you're into that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but dim, I don't want to ever be described as dim. That's just not a positive way to describe myself. Or gentle and silky. Subdued, okay, I guess, but does that mean that I needed to be subdued? I don't know how I feel about that. And lenient, that's not really a strong descriptor of somebody. And so you look at these words, you look at these like pair words for soft, and it becomes even more apparent that that's not what you want to be. That's not who you are. But maybe it might be nice to be compassionate. And compassion is a component of soft skills, but it's not the only reason why we're good communicators. It's not the only reason why we like to build teams. We're be we build teams because we're people, and it's fun. And so by using the word soft, it implies that these skills are less important, because you're comparing it to things like gentle, 
and dim and pleasing. And those are things that you would describe for soft animals or stuffed animals and like soft puppies. That's not how you would describe people that you enjoy working with and respect. Because I'm not a soft animal, I'm not a cheese, and I'm not a fluffy pillow. When it really comes down to it, my soft skills are there because I'm a person who likes to work with people. And so that's why this term doesn't fit. It doesn't describe my love of working with people and the interactions that I have with them. And so soft skills, out. I don't like that word. We're not going to use it anymore. You kind of run into the same thing with hard skills, which are not necessarily as easy to define because they can encompass a lot of different fields. But typically, you see things in science and mathematics and engineering or physical labor. So things like programming and statistical analysis are considered to be hard skills. These are often things that people think they can measure or test. Whether or not they actually can is not necessarily relevant, but you think you can measure them, you think you can test them. And you typically have certificates that are associated with them. Not always, but sometimes. There's some level of achievement associated here. And when I think of hard, I think of things that are difficult, like climbing a mountain. I have never done that. It would be really difficult for me to do. It would be hard. And then I think about hard textures, like hard hats or rain boots. I don't think about my programming skills. And it gets even scarier when you think about this in terms of programmers and how dogmatic we get sometimes, especially if you look at this first definition, solid, firm, and resistant to pressure. I don't want to be solid and firm. I want to be flexible. I want to be able to learn new things. I want to be able to work with all sorts of different people. And describing my ability to write code as a hard skill implies that it's inflexible and that I can't compromise and I can't work with other people. And not easily broken Benter Pierce. I don't know about you, but my tests fail all the time, like so often. <laughs> and sometimes you make new bugs. Sometimes you break production. It happens. I did it once. It was really scary. And I, you know, that's not true. That's, my skills can be broken. That's how they get better. And so this also is not really correct. And the secondary definition is climbing the mountain, requiring a great deal of endurance or effort. And while it may take a lot of effort to learn programming initially, and it may take endurance to get through that refactoring project or that horrible, horrible legacy code, it's not the hallmark definition of my skills. It is not difficult for me to write code. And so when you look at the synonyms for hard, it gets a little scary. There are some terrible, terrible words that you would never, ever want your employer to describe your skills with, like unyielding. You don't want to be an unyielding programmer. Maybe like unyielding to failure, that might be nice. But you wouldn't want to be strict, rigid, or severe either. You wouldn't want to think about your job as grueling. That's, that's horrible, that's depressing, that's so sad. And so really, none of these words are okay with me. I don't want these words to describe anyone in the programming world or anyone who has technical or mechanical abilities. It just, it's not right. I don't like it. They honestly sound like, to me, a list of qualities to avoid in a partner that you find on a dating service rather than something that you should see as a list of job requirements or a list of expectations for your capabilities. And when you think about it and you put it into words, my skills are not violent, and I'm not a strict and severe person, and it's not grueling for me to write code. But what it actually is, is mentally challenging, and it requires the necessary training and tools. And that's where you start to really break down what a hard skill is, something that's mentally challenging or requires training and tools. And after all this, it's pretty clear that hard and soft, there's a lot going on there. There's some different definitions. There's some weird connotations associated with these words. And so our tools are wrong. They don't mean the thing that we think they do. They don't mean the thing we hope they do. So we end up inferring. We end up assuming that they mean what we think they mean. And we just kind of like cross our fingers and hope that our employer doesn't think that we have gentle skills. You don't want that. You don't want them to think that you have violent skills. And so we can keep inferring until the cows come home or until the tests pass, but our tools are still broken. So not only are we using a hammer to screw a TV into a wall, but the hammer has no head. So we've just completely messed it up. And like that was my best tool analogy. I worked on it so hard because I'm not like a like candy person. <laughs> I had to really think about that one. I was like, what's a common tool? A hammer. Um, so that it's just not a good combination. When you have a broken tool that's the wrong tool for the job, you're just going to get all sorts of issues. And as a result, we struggle with these skills that don't fit perfectly into a box of soft or hard. And the best example I can think of that in the realm of open source and engineering is with code reviews. They're such 
this weird beast. Because you have to be a good communicator, but you also have to be strong technically to just open up someone's code and be able to know what's going on and relate it to the greater project as a whole. This is the hard thing. This is the thing that takes technical training and technical abilities, but also a knowledge of how to communicate with another person in a way that's productive and constructive and positive without knocking them down. And the reason this is so hard is because we don't prepare people effectively for soft skills. And so we're sometimes surprised, but communication problems happen a lot. And people will say, oh, you misinterpreted me. Maybe you just weren't an effective communicator because you weren't trained to be, and we don't reward that skill. Because who wants to be good at something that's soft? It's just so weird. It's got these weird connotations. So the end result is, let's make some new tools. We're developers. We have approximately 382 JavaScript frameworks. We can define new words that more accurately describe our capabilities as effective coworkers, communicators, open source contributors, and as technicians. So let's do this. Finish alternatives. We can do better. So when I was thinking about this, different words that I would describe my skills and my peers' skills, I was thinking, what am I actually trying to describe here? And for soft skills, I'm mostly trying to describe interpersonal skills or personality traits, task and management related skills, and any customer facing skills. So this is a lot in the realm of communication. Now that I've got kind of a roadmap of what I'm trying to define, some words start to pop up that make a little bit more sense than soft. Things like human or social, subjective and psychological, life learned, rational, personal, cognitive. There's a very human element. There's a very community element to these terms because the majority of them indicate that you're working with someone else or there's another perspective or there's other components at play. And so I like a lot of these, but we obviously can't use all of them. And when we do the same thing for hard, we're talking about certified or things that can be have a certificate things that are testable or measurable knowledge, or things that people think they can test and measure, <laughs> and skills related to using that knowledge. You can't determine how good a programmer someone is because it's a little bit subjective, but we like to have some measures of what's a good programmer. We have code smells, we have design frameworks or design patterns. We have those things to kind of like make boxes that determine whether or not you're a good programmer. So we kind of measure your knowledge, and we kind of measure how you use it, but it's still not really like, it's kind of soft, the edges. See what I did there? And so when you look, think about hard skills and the ability to test and measure knowledge and then use that knowledge, you start to get some more terms that are a little bit more palatable than hard. Things like technical and academic, robot, which is my favorite, <laughs> book learned, specialized, mechanical, quantifiable, these all play up something about a skill being measured or a skill being testable in some way. Whether or not it's an official test or a measure that we actually care about, we can still measure it in some way. So we've got some words now, and now we get to make some paired alternatives. This makes me really happy, because these are the tools that we can now use to describe ourselves and our abilities with our friends. And there's strengths and weaknesses to each pair. They're not always right for every situation. Some of these aren't great for engineers, but they might be better for scientists and researchers. So interpersonal and quantifiable, as a, and so the top is the replacement for soft, hence the cute font, and the bottom is the replacement for hard. So interpersonal and quantifiable, and this emphasizes that skills are measurable or immeasurable, and it uses that as the distinction. And so for us as programmers and open source contributors, this probably won't be the best option for us, because like I said, you can't measure how good of a program, programmer someone is truly objectively. But for scientists, you might be able to quantify their skills based on the acceptance of peer-reviewed papers or on how thorough their research is or their grants, et cetera, et cetera. And so this, maybe not right for us, might be right for others. I also really like psychological and technical because it's really paying attention to the mental effort required in both skill sets. It's saying that technical is a different type of mental effort than psychological. But they both require thought processes. They both require effort. And it also calls a little bit of attention to the psychology that's involved with being a leader in a community or a leader on a team. So it's more than just having the skills. It's having also knowledge. And I know we don't all learn stuff out of books anymore or these days. But it's still a little relevant to use this as a comparison because it distinguishes the difference between practice and training. And so with life learned skills, 
if you enroll in public school as a child, you're constantly being shaped about what's an appropriate way to interact with someone. And you go through public school and you, or you go into the workplace, you interact with people. Pretty much everyone interacts with another person throughout their life. So you're shaping these interactions as you go through your life. And that's practice. You get a ton of practice at being a person. But for book learning skills, for those technical capabilities, you have to start somewhere. You have to start with some sort of training. And you may continue to train throughout your life. And you definitely practice those skills that you learned in the training. But you have to have some sort of official documentation or source of knowledge that you start with. And the big, like, the big distinguishing factor here is I can go and read a book on a new programming language, and I can memorize it. And that's my foundation. And I can build from that in practice. But I can't read a book on how to interact with people. I can try, but there are about 500 books on negotiation. There are about 5,000 books on marriage counseling. So there are so many different ways to interact with people that it's not possible for you to train yourself by memorizing problem, solution, how to talk to somebody. You, you just can't do that with interpersonal skills. And this one's super cute, human versus robot. Um, this one is kind of interesting because with programming, we're often working to make computers more human. So you might have to be like human cyborg robot with this one and have like three layers. But this values the human interactions and individuality over the processes that can be automated. And <clears throat> it's important for us to remember that while we often work with computers, we are not computers. We are people. We are not robots. We do not roll around on the floor and make cute beeping noises. <clears throat> and it highlights the difference between artificial and human intelligence. And that line is getting blurrier and blurrier and blurrier, but that doesn't matter to us because we can add a third category, cyborg. <laughs> you know. This one is my favorite, social and mechanical. Uh, mechanical does have some associations with physical ability and ability to move, so there might be some ableist connotations in here that I might want to take into consideration before I use this as like my wide scale term. But I like this because mechanical, you think of mechanics. I mean, that's what I think of. I think of a car mechanic. I think of somebody with tools. And then I think of social paired with mechanical. And I realize that you need tools for both of these. And it implies that you need tools for both. We can't write code without some sort of computer. We could write it down on paper, but it has to be processed by a computer somehow. A computer is involved. We need a laptop or a Chromebook or a Raspberry Pi, whatever you please, to type out your code. And you also need social tools to communicate with people as well. You need practice over time, and you need the ability to read facial cues, infer meaning. All these things are tools in our social toolbox. And so I went from talking about using a broken hammer. This would actually be a metaphorical solid hammer that does what it's supposed to do. <clears throat> And so now we've got some ideas about different ways to describe these. And in conversation, I tend to say things like interpersonal or communication to describe soft skills. And now I'm going to go to my workplace. And I'm going to talk to my coworkers, my managers, or VPs. And I'm going to say, hey, look, our engineering job descriptions are terrible. Let's make them better. Let's make them reflect the real people that work at this job and reward them for their ability to communicate and conduct teams and write good code reviews. So I've got some tips. For teachers and mentors, I think these people, and I'm a teacher and a mentor, so I guess myself as well, I think these people are hugely important because they can really set people up for success. I think it's hugely important to teach ethics, and not in the sense like you go to a philosophy class and you take an ethics class, but ethics of a shared set of community values, like a code of conduct. That's a shared set of community values. Something like that. You should be teaching that, but you should also be modeling that. You should be modeling that with social skills because imitation is a really, really great way for people to learn how to behave and how to interact. You should reward progress, even if they're teeny tiny baby steps. And you should correct missteps constructively, positively, and potentially in private, depending on the person that you're interacting with. For interviewers and hiring managers, this is a little bit more work, but it's worth it because you can control the people that come into your company and you can bring in some really vibrant and wonderful people. Ask a ton of questions. Ask them about their interpersonal skills. Instead of beating around the bush, ask them how they feel about communicating with the team if they're remote. How do you feel about communicating over chat? How do you feel about talking on the phone? I hate talking on the phone. 
if an employer asked me that, I would tell them because I didn't want to spend my job talking on the phone. It would make me a bad employee if I had to do that. And so asking these kind of questions and finding out their expectations for their interpersonal interactions is going to help you bring on the best people and it's going to help you bring on happy people. And then inform them of the expectations you have for this role and why you value those abilities specifically. Because it's very easy to say, we value your ability to program because it creates revenue for us. We value your ability to communicate because you lead teams more effectively, therefore producing more revenue for us. And while it's still related to revenue, how many times does somebody tell you you're a good communicator, that affects our bottom line in a positive way? And so inform them that you care about these and why you care about these. And then if it doesn't seem like they're on the same page as you, kind of adjust their expectations to see if things are a good fit and if they're feeling comfortable with match. Last but not least, managers and team leads, the people who I love and adore. This is a ton of work, but it's absolutely worth it because you're going to get happier teams and you're going to have people that love what they do and you're going to have people that want to help make their fellow coworkers better. At least I think so, but I'm an optimist. So. So work with upper management and your direct reports and the HR team to collaboratively change your job descriptions to include these interpersonal and communication skills as hallmarks for raises, as hallmarks for hiring. And once you have a job description that you really like, get HR to review it and formally approve it. Get it on the books, get it filed in whatever official filing system your company has and have it sit there forever. And after that's done, have a meeting and tell your employees what you expect of them now because you've just changed their core job description. <clears throat> you should provide training for your employees. And a lot of people when I say this go, Liz, no, it's so expensive. It takes up so much time, revenue, bottom line. But listen, if you do pair programming, feedback, and code review workshops internally, you, unless you're working at a super tiny company, you probably don't have to hire external consultants to do that. How many people like to pair? You don't have to raise your hand. This is not a question question. <laughs> but I guarantee you they've got at least one person at your company that has some fuzzy feelings about pairing. They may not love it, but they like it and they have some opinions about it. They can teach a pair programming workshop and you can practice pairing for a day. Even if you're not a pair programming company, learning those skills helps you communicate with other people when you're not working on code together. Feedback workshops are great because it's really hard and stressful for some people to give feedback to someone else. How do you tell someone that their code review was really bad and offensive? You don't just do the same thing they did. You don't communicate really poorly and offensively. You want to communicate productively and constructively. And training on that is huge. Just like with code review workshops, code review, I'm a firm believer, is an art form. And while it takes a lot of practice to get good at it, you also need uh, the right tools and the right foundation to, to spring from to learn. And so doing these kind of workshops internally, you're training your employees. You're providing them with new job skills. You're making them better at what they do. This is a win-win. It's a win for employers. It's a win for employees. And then you've trained them. They've got these new skills. So let's make some opportunities. Find new leaders and assign them to small projects. Or have people pair program to reinforce a newly learned technical skill or a newly learned interpersonal skill. Give feedback frequently, as often as you can possibly manage, emotionally and physically. Do it regularly and do it spontaneously. I like weekly check-ins because it's a time that you've set aside on the calendar. You've got those 15 or 30 minutes or hour or however long. You've got that time chunked off to talk with your manager or your direct reports one-on-one. -on -one. That's your time. And that's, you get to use it how you want. But you should also spontaneously give people feedback. If they just gave you an awesome code review, tell them they gave you an awesome code review. If their code review was a little disheartening, maybe constructively reply to some comments or discuss it with them personally. And this feedback shouldn't be a two-way street. It should be a loop. It should be constantly happening. You should be receiving and giving feedback regularly. So in conclusion, it's easy to be a unicorn because they are magical. <laughs> and <laughs> right, they are. They're so cool. And so when we look at job descriptions that say unicorn, we get kind of excited and we're like, yes, I shit rainbows of code with my fingers. <laughs> and you think that that's so cool. But then you realize that you're not a unicorn and you can't fly and that you're actually a person. 
And we have to remember that while it's super exciting and easy to be a unicorn, we're people first and foremost, and how we communicate and how we work with others is hugely important. And the better you get at it, I think personally, the more rewarding your experience in the open source community and as a coworker will be. So, bye. Thank you.